Cynthia, I know that your uh, hope is uh, fed by activism and if you would um, share your story and how it has moved you forward on your, um, your work dealing with uh, nuclear, the nuclear threat. Thank you. Well, uh, thank you, Maureen, and thank you, John, and um, deep bows of gratitude for bringing us together and convening this conference at this time, this Code Red for Humanity moment. Uh, it's really rare to be in a space where the climate crisis and the nuclear weapons challenges are brought together. And it's so important right now. It's sort of the essence and the heart of what we need to do is to come together, um, all of us, so that we can be unstoppable. And so I'm just really grateful to you for this and really so deeply honored to be in the presence of Martha, Carol, and those who came before who, because it's so early in Hawaii, I haven't had a chance to hear you, but I will listen to you soon. Um, so it's my great honor to be here. Thank you. Uh, I want to start by saying that this work is deeply, deeply personal for me, and I'm going to share my screen. So for me, this really the story begins back in childhood. Um, I grew up during the Cold War, and I heard over and over again that the Soviet Union was always going to be our enemy and that we were all most likely going to die in a nuclear war. But I didn't buy this enemy story, and I joined the global movement for nuclear disarmament. And in the 1980s, I worked as a citizen diplomat uh, in the Soviet Union trying to prevent a nuclear war. We all were thrilled when we lived to see the impossible become possible, or so it seemed impossible at the time. Um, when our leaders came together, um, started talking about disarmament and actually embarked on what would become the largest reductions in our nuclear arsenals in history. So after the Cold War ended, I thought I could stop worrying about nuclear war. And I went to work on coral reefs and climate change because I love the sea and I love coral reefs and I couldn't imagine leaving a world without reefs to my daughter and all future generations. I thought I'd be doing that work for the rest of my life. But all of this changed for me in 2017 when I was asked to work on this film. And I interviewed dozens of the world's top experts on nuclear dangers and US-Russia relations. Pretty much everybody I spoke to reawakened me to today's staggering nuclear danger. The two people who had the greatest impact on me were our former US Secretary of Defense, William Perry, and former Soviet leader, Mikhail Gorbachev. Secretary Perry said to me that today we're at a greater risk of a nuclear catastrophe than we were during the Cold War, and that most people are blissfully unaware of this danger. And then he turned to me and he said, we're sleepwalking into a nuclear catastrophe and we must wake up. At that moment, I realized that I'd been sleepwalking since the end of the Cold War. And for me, that was a very devastating, awakening re revelation. President Gorbachev said to me that our relations have been going from bad to worse. We must break out of this situation. We won't survive if someone loses their nerves in the current tension. I flew home from that interview with Gorbachev in December of 2017 here to Hawaii. And it was at the height of the fire and fury between Donald Trump and Kim Jong-un. And nuclear tensions were particularly high here in Hawaii because we knew that we had been marked on a target on Pyongyang's map of nuclear death. So all of this was present in my awareness on the morning of January 13th, 2018, when I was one of over a million people across the Hawaiian islands who all got this message on our cell phones, ballistic missile threat inbound to Hawaii, seek immediate shelter, this is not a drill. So at first the feeling was, can this be real? And so we started to call 911, but we couldn't get through because everybody was dialing 911, trying to find out the answer to that question. And so then my partner said to me, I don't know if this is real or not, but I'm gonna get the girls. Our two younger daughters were seven miles away in the town of Kapa'a. And I said, wait a second, because he rushed to go out the door. I said, 
I don't want to be separated. I don't want to plan if, there, if it is real. And he said, call me in the car and we'll figure it out. So he was out the door and I stood there dazed. And I thought, who do I know is going to know? And I immediately thought of my dear friend, Felicia Calton, who's a journalist, who's the first to know anything that's going on and everybody takes her phone call. And so I started to call her. I left a message. I texted her. I checked her Facebook page. Nothing. And after what seemed like an eternity, she called me back. And she said, Cynthia, the county is telling us to take shelter. And for me, that was it. Because the county is our government here. They run everything. And I thought, my God, this is real. I have to take this seriously. So the first thing was, where do we go? There are no designated nuclear shelters in the state of Hawaii. And so we thought of the most sealed environment that was nearby. And that is a meditation cave on a neighbor's property. And we agreed to meet there. And then it was, what am I going to take with me? And so I looked down at my phone and it had 12% charge. And I thought, oh no. And then I thought, I think there are electric lights in the cave. I think that maybe there's an outlet. So I grabbed a woven bag and I threw my phone charger, my computer, my computer charger. I just started throwing things in the bag, my purse, my passport. And there was this feeling of a myth ever going to need any of these things if there really is a nuclear attack? Is this insane? And then I thought about food and water. And I thought, I've done nothing to prepare my family for this. We had been instructed to have uh, ready um, 14 days of water and food, a gallon per person per day, and enough canned food for 14 days um, by the Hawaii Emergency Management Agency during the fire and fury, they were telling us how to prepare and survive for a nuclear attack. And so I realized that I'd done nothing to do to prepare the family. And I looked on the shelf and I had two small bottles of water and I threw those in the bag and a bunch of bananas on the counter. And then I just ran to the car because even though the cave is just a couple minutes away, I didn't know how many minutes we had. Um, and so as I started driving away, it was only at that moment that I allowed myself to think about my elder daughter who had just left for Los Angeles a couple of days before. And I thought, I've got to call her to say goodbye. And if I'd thought of her a moment earlier, I probably wouldn't have been able to hold it together to organize myself. So the phone was ringing and ringing and ringing as I drove to the, to the cave and she wasn't picking up. And I parked and I started running towards the foot of the steps to the cave. And she still wasn't picking up. It was still ringing. And just as I got to the foot of the steps of the cave, she picked up. And I said, Mackenzie, I don't know if you've heard, but we've all gotten this message on our cell phones that we're going to be hit by a ballistic missile and we're going to shelter in the cave and I'll call you again from the cave if I can. And I just want you to know that I love you. And she said, mom, I love you too. And at that moment, it was as though time stopped for me. I didn't want to let her go. So I stood there frozen and I thought, will I ever see her again? Will I ever hear her voice again? And then I thought, wait a second, is this not just about not hearing her voice again or seeing her again, but is, and is this not just about one nuclear missile from North Korea? Is this many nuclear missiles coming from Russia to us and many from us going back to them? Is this the beginning of one of those accidental nuclear wars that Secretary Perry and Gorbachev and so many of the experts I interviewed are so worried about? Is this the beginning of the end of life as we know it? Is this the beginning of the end of everything we know and love and cherish on this earth? And then I heard, mom, mom, go, go. And it was Mackenzie jolting me out of this. And so I said, I love you. And I started running up the steps on the hill towards the cave. And as I got to the door of the cave and was about to open it, it opened. And it was my neighbor, Colleen. And she was smiling. And she said, it was a false alarm. It took 38 minutes for our government to send us a message on our cell phones telling us that it was a false alarm. And even with everything that I knew about nuclear war and nuclear weapons and Hiroshima and fallout and radiation, nuclear war was unimaginable to me until I went through those 38 minutes. 
And now this experience lives inside of me as a mother, as a human being. It's in my gut and it's never going to go away until we eliminate nuclear, eliminate nuclear weapons, which is why this is deeply personal for me and why I'm here sharing the story with you all today. So as I walked away um, from the cave, the first thing that I felt was gratitude. It was this feeling of, we're all still here. I'm still here. I was pinching my cheeks. It was as though um, we were given another chance. And it was this feeling of being born anew, of everything looking new. The wind, all of my senses were enhanced. The wind was kissing my cheeks. The palm trees were dancing. The sound of the ocean never sounded so sweet. As I walked back onto the land um, and saw the crown flower bush, the colors had never been so vibrant. Everything was just the purples, the greens, everything was this revelation of a love for life, the butterflies. And so I came to this feeling of, this is a wake up call that's a gift. And then there was this feeling of, you need to share this. You need to start writing this down right now. And I did. I started that day while it was fresh and I wrote for months. And so since that time, I'm gonna share my screen again. I felt compelled to share this experience in as many ways as possible as a prayer, as an offering of awakening to action. And so I've written articles, I'm in podcasts, I do nuclear alert simulations, I speak at conferences like the one today, a VR simulation, whatever way I can do it. And in the projects we do at nuclearwakeupcall.earth. While writing the article, there was a point that I came to where I thought awakening is not enough. It's got to be awakening to action. And so inspired by recommendations from Secretary Perry and Gorbachev and so many NGOs and activists, um, I came up with a 10-step program called the Nuclear Playbook. And Martha has mentioned many of them, and I've realigned them since then, updated them many times, and now they are in line with the Back from the Brink campaign, the first five that Martha referenced, um, that basically uh, address reducing the risk of a nuclear catastrophe, what I say, what we need to do to stay here while we work on the overall immediate absolute overarching objective, which is to abolish nuclear weapons. But we have, to, we have to make sure that we reduce the risk because it's really high. Many of these initiatives in the first five steps uh, are, are attached to legislation. Um, and so there, there is a way to really try to move these things through the Congress. The second five steps address something that we don't hear a lot about in the movement um, and we need to hear more about, which is, really they were designed with Russia in mind because um, our two countries still have over 90% of the world's nuclear weapons. And it's really up to us to take the lead in reducing our arsenals. Um, if you look at the map here, you can do the math and the US and Russia have 12,175 weapons in our uh, warheads in our, or in our inventories and um, China has basically said that had declared that they will not consider reductions until we come down to their level. And so you look at China and they're at 320. So I wanted to give a shout out now to my colleagues at Global Zero who have really come up with the most sound and variable pathway to get to zero that I have seen. And it takes us down to the level of China and then beyond. We go beyond that with China and all the other nuclear armed states. And also a shout out to my colleagues at the American Committee for US-Russia Accord for really dedicating themselves to um, maintaining the dialogue with Russia, advocating for a strategic partnership on shared interests, reducing the risk of nuclear war, and also ending the new Cold War with Russia. In this work, we always ask, what can be game changing? And so that's a question that I 
wake up every day thinking about what can we do? And so I'm gonna mention two projects quickly that um, aspire to be game-changing that we're, do we're doing at Nuclear Wake Up Call Earth. One is called Women Transforming Our Nuclear Legacy, um, which is catalyzing a global, global movement of women and girls to eliminate nuclear weapons. Because since the dawn of the nuclear age, women have largely been shut out of nuclear security planning and decision-making and policy-making. And today we're still grossly underrepresented in this field. And excluding half of the human race for much of the nuclear age has brought us to the brink of possible extinction. Because the research shows that when women are involved, peace becomes more possible and peace agreements more enduring. So it's really an existential imperative that we write a new nuclear story and that women come forward to lead and join the company of men. We claim our seats at the table to change our nuclear policy and transform our nuclear legacy. Uh, we had our inaugural session about a year ago and we've since engaged over 400 women from over 42 countries, including eight of the nine nuclear armed states. And you're all invited to join. The other project I wanna mention is called Bearing Straight for Peace. We are gathering with indigenous peoples in, from the United States and Russia um, in the Bering Strait, in the place between those two little islands in the center of the satellite map that you can see there, which is the place where our border is less than three miles apart. Um, we're gathering that indigenous peoples will be sharing uh, prophecy, art, culture, music, dance, um, initiating joint climate monitor monitoring and marine conservation programs in this place and doing a ceremony for climate justice and for peace. And this is a place where we see the intersection of what this conference is about. Because of the melting Arctic ice, there is an increase in tensions in the region. We see an increase in military intercepts, strategic rivalry and competition for resources. Um, and we're seeing an escalating risk of conflict. So this is a place that we're gonna be doing this work in the coming year or two. And I echo what Martha said, for me, the greatest uh, ray of light and hope in this work, the really game-changing thing is the Treaty on the Prohibition of Nuclear Weapons, adopted by 122 countries at the UN in 2017, achieved the necessary 50th ratification last year and entered into force this year on January 22nd. This is truly unlike any nuclear weapons treaty that's come before. It's historic. It's the first nuclear weapons treaty based on humanitarian, not military law. The first to ban nuclear weapons and make them illegal. The first to recognize the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on women and girls due to ionizing radiation. The, and the first to recognize the disproportionate impact of nuclear weapons on indigenous peoples, thus the first to address radioactive racism. It's the first to provide compensation to victims of nuclear use, testing, and production, and the first to challenge the nuclear apartheid and colonialism of prevailing global nuclear policy. There are so many ways that we can get involved in supporting this treaty, and uh, you can get your country, your city, your elected representatives involved, and you can get involved in divestment which this is again where the intersectionality is of our movements. It's really all about divestment and it's all about um, freeing up the trillions that are being wasted on weapons of mass destruction and extracting fossil fuels and repurposing them to bring us climate justice and uh, addressing the ex existential threat of the pandemic and all of the urgent challenges that we face today. Ambassador Elaine White Gomez, who negotiated the Treaty on the Prohibition for Nuclear Weapons at the UN, was our honored guest at um, our first inaugural session of Women Transforming a Nuclear Legacy. And she said, she's an extraordinary soul, that history is made by every single step that we take every day. And she planted the seed that it's up to each and every one of us to join together to do this. And she invited all of us to join her in the campaign to abolish nuclear weapons and to make history with her. So 
In closing, I just want to say that this work is always evolving, but for me, it's really a matter of the heart. Abolishing nuclear weapons is an act of love. Love for my daughter, love for life, love for our dearest loved ones, love for our beloved earth, love for all we hold dear. Thank you.